Our next speaker is Stefan Heidemann, who is Professor of Islamic Studies at the University of Hamburg, where he's been since 2011. Um, formerly, he served as an Associate Curator of Islamic Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art across the park and Professor of Islamic History and Material Culture here at the Bard Graduate Center. His PhD is from the Freie Universität uh, in Berlin from 1993, and he habilitated at the University of Jena in 2001. He's currently Principal Investigator of the ERC Advanced Grant Project, The Early Islamic Empire at Work, The View from the Regions Toward the Center, and Editor-in-Chief of the journal Der Islam. He is the author of The Renaissance of the Cities in Northern Syria and Northern Mesopotamia, which was published in 2002, and also the editor uh, of a number of works focusing on the history of Islamic numismatics. Uh, he has five major research projects, as I said, the early Islamic empire at work, also coinage, commerce, and taxation in the Eastern Mediterranean in the late Middle Ages, uh, a project on al Raqqa at the Euphrates, on the Middle Islamic period, and social, economic, and cultural transformations in Syria and northern Mesopotamia, and ongoing interest in Islamic numismatics. Uh, he's here today to speak about as you can see, appreciating, collecting, and the meaning of ancient objects in the early and middle Islamic period. Stefan. So, thank you, Peter, for the introduction. I'm very thrilled to be uh, here in my old uh, alma mater, the Bart Graduate Center, and uh, that I can speak to you. And you will see that um, uh, this talk will interlink with uh, the uh, previous uh, three talks uh, quite well. So this is the... I guess so. So the appreciation of objects of the past uh, includes a number of aspects uh, that are sometimes conflated and sometimes overlap. The appreciation of ancient relics within the Catholic Church met other ends in the antiquarianism of the humanists that paved the way for the Renaissance. The classical and biblical antiquarianism of the post-Seven Years' War in Europe even led to modern art history, archaeology, and to Near Eastern archaeology, and partly also to Islamic studies. The term for the appreciation and collecting of ancient goods did not exist as such in pre-modern uh, uh, lexicography. However, we can identify practices and intellectual and even ideological interactions with um, ancient objects. Given the scarcity of sources, we have to embrace a wide classifying approach. And here uh, I uh, overlap a little bit uh, with uh, Stephanie's, but I have quite an, uh, a different angle. The Arab literary culture was always aware about the glory of the past, especially of its magnificent uh, architecture, apparently built up by giants, it admired in its poetry and its historical works the greatness of the past long gone, the Atlal. Gigantic architecture which could not be achieved by the contemporary means. They were strange things, raraib and wonders, ajaib. Not all engagement with the ancient objects are intellectual ways of studying the past. While this approach shares some categories with Stephanie's uh, efforts, it has nevertheless a quite different angle. So useful memories, collecting uh, of treasures and relics, ancient objects for magical purposes, and um, the antiquarian use of objects. While the first three fields will be a kind of review of current research, my emphasis lies within the fourth field. The first, useful memories, the first is a useful memory in the sense of Jan Asman. The study ancient uh, um, uh, artifacts and the architecture um, have to be useful, um, visible symbols, resonant within the targeted contemporary society or as a social group. This resonant effort might be based in part on collecting, but it seems to be mainly based on contemporary visibility of past architecture. The actor is not the studying ruler displaying his erudition, but the ruler displaying his connections with the past glory which he wants to invigorate uh, or receive. The architecture of the Umayyad period, its egg and dart friezes in Kasr al-Her al-Rarbi, the tetrapylon in uh, Anjar, 
its colonnades, seems to evoke the glory uh, of the early Roman Empire of the 3rd century rather than the contemporary rival Christian Byzantine Empire. It highlights perhaps the superior imperial tradition of the Omayyad Islamic Empire, easily decoded the new millenarian Islamic Empire brings back useful memory of the glory of the old long gone empire. The Sasanian political legacy, however, uh, was adopted, absorbed and continued by the Abbasids. It is hard to speak here from a useful memory of the Sasanians, more a continuation uh, of the imperial tradition. According to the Iranian idea of Khura or Far, the royal glory, which has then passed to the new Islamic rulers. But later rulers made use of that memories of the Sasanian Shahanshahs when uh, the Abbasids had failed to deliver on their imperial promises in the 10th century. The Ziyarids, the Buyids, invoked the useful memories in a number of uh, well-known artifacts. We see a reiteration of the mostly Iranian empire under the Buyids, which I have just showed. Uh, uh, Alain showed the Salrurids and also quoted uh, the Akoyunlu uh, inscriptions and the Qajars and others, which seemingly have their starting point in the visibility of ancient architecture and the centrality of Istahr Persepolis for the Iranian past. These dynasties were able to highlight these, this idealized Sasanian past because already the Abbasids had placed Sasanian Iranian culture firmly into the center of their imperial culture. It is a version of the Islamic uh, Sasanian past which had shed all the religious Zoroastrian heritage, an idealized form of Sasanian imperial history and Islamic culture did not form a contradiction to each other as a Roman Christian legacy might have. On the other side, the Zoroastrians, uh, Zoroastrian religion and their priests manifest in its religious writings during the Abbasid period had shed completely its Im Sasanian imperial heritage. So the imperial heritage was free to be adopted by the Abbasids without any religious connotations. The rich Sasani, uh, Zoroastrian Pahlavi literature of the 9th and 10th century does not make any reference to the Sasanian Empire. More difficult uh, to classify is the classicizing architecture and artifacts in the Artukid, Zengid and Ayyubid period in Syria and northern Mesopotamia. The general absence of any contemporary literature referencing the antiquity of buildings or spoils or the new design of uh, classicizing buildings is startling. The classicizing attitude seems to be paralleled with the growing genre of the regional and urban histories conveying a rising urban pride, resurrected in the architecture might be um, the reason for uh, this classicizing attitude. This rebirth of classical forms may also be paralleled with a renewed interest in Arabic translations from Greek antiquity uh, appearing in the Middle Islamic period. These classicizing efforts must, may be even seen with Terry Allen as a reflection on our useful memory on the glorious early Islamic period. While there is certainly an understanding of the classical forms, but the absence of interpreting contemporary literature leaves an intellectual discovery uh, of the pre-Islamic past open. Collecting of treasures and relics. Secondly, we have uh, as a mere collecting of treasures and relics, ancient and contemporary, the Raraib, strange things, or the Ajaib, the astounding wonders. Um, but this doesn't qual qualify really as antiquarianism and studying of the past via objects. The most famous report originates from the Al Qadi al Rashid, who lived in the 12th century Egypt. His Zahra'ir Watohaf. Treasures and valuables is a description of stately gifts at the end of um, uh, and at the end of treasures uh, within the treasuries of various rulers, which includes pre-Islamic objects. For example, the treasure of the last Umayyad caliph, 
which was seized by the Abbasids, included allegedly pharaonic glass bowls depicting a lion and a man. It was later presented by the Abbasids to rule in India. Or into the same category belongs the collection of ancient objects from the Timurid period in the Mughal uh, treasure. Not only the idealized imperial past is remembered in these uh, treasure collections, but also relics of the religious past can be found, such as the relics of the Prophet Muhammad, now in the Ottoman treasury uh, uh, in Topkapi. The third group uh, of engagement um, with ancient objects is the use of ancient objects uh, for magical purposes. And um, this was already referenced. Barry Flood uh, explained once the use of spolia for apotropaic and magical purposes. In the same category of magical, uh, of magic of ancient objects and scripts uh, fall hieroglyph, uh, hieroglyphs belonging to the literature of ancient uh, Egyptian uh, scripts, objects, and monuments. This often coincides with the miraculous stories about their discovery of these kind of uh, hidden objects, especially in the cases of ancient Egyptian architecture and artifacts. The book on pyramids and the Middle Islamic chronicles have a number of such entertaining stories, uh, as Ulrich Hamann has shown. It is not always to be, uh, it has not always to be the pyramids, but there are also smaller ancient objects, collectibles, used for magical purposes. The Berlin coin cabinet includes a contornia to it from the 4th and 5th century, uh, originally a token coin for gift purposes among uh, the Roman elite. It depicts Trajan, and on the other side we see a probably magical inscription. In inscriptions of such kind, Uh, of objects use an archaic looking form of writing, a linear cubic, which convey a sense of antiquity as well as sense of mystery because only the initiate um, uh, is able to decipher it. And the object has not to be new. They, have, they are for their magical purposes. They can be this probably 12th century um, um, ancient looking uh, en cabuchon cut um, uh, rock crystal has also this kind of um, um, magical linear cubic. But now uh, to the antiquarian use of objects. The force field looks, uh, the, the force field from the few traces, looks uh, at the few traces of practice more akin uh, to the Western Mobigliani's understanding of antiquarianism. The appreciation and study of the past through old material and uh, collecting them. And uh, Sarah already had um, um, uh, uh, illuminated uh, as this um, attitude. Collecting material, researching its provenance, placing it into a context and even checking whether the context uh, is reasonable to believe for its pretended historical origin, thus exploring the past, is almost second nature to scholars in the Islamic world. Islamic uh, scholars brought together a vast collection, and Sarah showed uh, some of the Miskawai and the Tabari, not only uh, of objects, but of Hadith traditions uh, of about the Prophet and its, com uh, and its companion, and Akbar historical information, a richness as we do not have it in any other culture and uh, in any other uh, culture, perhaps with the exception of the Chinese. These unprecedented collecting efforts resulted in the 9th and 10th century to vast compendia of traditions of the prophets and his associates, um, to universal collections of Akbar's histories, such as Tarawis or even larger biographical dictionaries, Ibn Sa'ad's uh, Tabakat. Uh, many of these scholars were avid book collectors and book lovers, such as the 13th century scholar Safadi and the 15th century scholar Al-Makrisi. The most famous among them is uh, surely Ibn Anadim, who collected not only information on every available book uh, or known uh, Arabic book in Baghdad, but was also a collector of books for himself. Autographs were a prized object. Differences between Western and Islamic um, antiquarianism can be analyzed when we consider two aspects. 
of the Western antiquarianism. One is a study, and I emphasize, uh, the idealized Roman Latin past and beyond via objects. And the other is biblical antiquarianism, to collect objects to prove or illustrate the historicity of the biblical events. Let me start uh, with the biblical antiquarianism. Biblical antiquarianism and its interest in Hebrew and Arabic and in extension in Syriac and Coptic texts um, began in the 17th century. Its beginning are connected with names such as Johann Heinrich Hottinger and others. Biblical antiquarianism became a major intellectual force in the, 18th, in the late 18th century after the Seven Years' War. The interest was a study and the verification of the ancient oriental biblical past through objects. Herde, its studies became mainstream uh, within the Protestant uh, theology of enlightenment, which viewed the Old Testament as historical text, but how, about how humans interacted with the divine in their historical, still childlike phase of the Bible. Most significant is Herder's Erste Urkunde des Menschengeschlechts, which viewed the Pentateuch, the Torah, as the first document of human history. Biblical texts were and are not anymore perceived as metaphysical Heilsgeschichte, survivic uh, history, but as historically contextualized sources. The biblical antiquarianism lead to Oriental studies and even to Near Eastern archaeology. Let me now formulate a parallel hypothesis on an Islamic biblical Quranic uh, antiquarianism. Was there any interest in the biblical chain of prophets, at least um, how they are described in the Quran? The Quran knows uh, at about 25, 25 uh, prophets from Adam to Muhammad, among them well-known figures such as Nuh, Ibrahim, Ismail, Musa, Sulaiman, and Isa ibn Maryam. There was definitely an early Islamic strand to explore the biblical realm um, and the Christian history of martyrs for God, which are Shohada, which lived uh, centuries before Muhammad. Many of the early converts came from Christianity. Thus, a number of mosques in the Jazeera were named after Christian saints. More illustrati <coughs> illustrative, is the joint entry to the crypt of the Christian martyr of the 3rd century St. Jerg's Basilica in Rusafa in Syria. One can enter it from the basilica or from the joint courtyard of the adjacent mosque. It was built during the reign and presence of the Caliph Hisham in Rusafa in the early 8th century before Islamic theology um, uh, became, came into being as we know it today. Indeed, We find uh, also uh, collectible genres, the Kisas al Anbiya, the stories of the Prophet, in early Arab literature. In, um, <clears throat> in world histories, such as the one of Al Tabari, called Tarikh al Rusul, Wal Muluk, the history of the messengers and kings, we have a long part about the early prophets. But Christian saints, Shuhada, witnesses for God, never became a literary Islamic topic. But we have also to consider the influential uh, theological verdict or roadblock that all religious um, knowledge before the revelation of Muhammad belongs to the Jahiliya, the period of ignorance. Seemingly, it has not encouraged scholars to inquire further um, biblical Quranic prophets and in particular, perhaps even pre-Islamic Christian martyrs for God either. When the veneration of holy men indicated, um, uh, including pre-Islamic prophets, became again popular in the Middle East, uh, as expressed in the book of, uh, of Al-Harawi of the 13th century, the pil uh, Pilgrim's Handbook, the Kitab al -Ziyara. It, it did not translate in an interest in the historical context of these uh, people. Uh, Stephanie uh, uh, had um, uh, some, uh, um, uh, uh, some examples uh, of that. The interest of the relics in the pre-Islamic uh, past remained largely in the realm of Heilsgeschichte. In extreme reverse, we see it with the Saudi government in Mecca, and um, we have seen it with the IS um, and other groups in Syria and Iraq, 
who then actively remove historical material context of the interaction of humankind with the divine. One of the starting points for Western antiquarianism uh, in the period of humanism and renaissance was a growing interest of scholars in the idealized Roman Latin legacy and by extension to the Greek past through texts and its verifying objects. Via the imperial language Latin, most of the sources were easily accessible for them. Anything before the Romans and Greeks was hardly to be known or to be collected, although some Bronze-era tumuli stirred up curiosity among regional antiquarians in the 18th century. Via the former imperial language and their physical environment, people, uh, people surrounded by these monuments felt an, an immediate connection with the Roman imperial past. Similarly, in the Islamic Empire and its successor states, the interest of the scholars lied in the collection of Akbar of the Islamic past, for example, the Futuh period and its pre-imperial foundation period, that means Muhammad's time, the Sira. By the way of extension, there was an interest in the pre-Islamic Arab um, past on the Arab Peninsula as the home of the first imperial elite, and secondly, by the way of extension, into the Iranian past, because the Abbasids incorporated the Sasanian imperial legacy without any reservation into its own. Bottom line, we have to look closer at the collectors of Akbar, whether they had become interested into objects, uh, to objects and of the two strands, the Arab past, and the early Islamic and Sasanian past, and whether they present us with something they have learned from their studies of a resounding uh, uh, part, of a resonant past. And indeed, the ancient South Arabian objects and its past were studied in the eighth book of uh, Al Hamdani's Al Iqlil in a search for the pre Islamic. Uh, past. He described South, the South Arabian alphabet um, as palm, uh, um, uh, palm core uh, letters and had definitely experience with the monuments. He would fit the description uh, of the antiquarian. Asabi, looking at the early Islamic and Sasanian past, we find also some candidates. Abu Ishaq Ibrahim Asabi was a polymath of the 10th century Iraq, a doctor, astronomer, and an historian. Unfortunately, he found himself imprisoned by the Buyid ruler Adud ad His almost uh, uh, um, renaissance-like interest in ancient coins and history is found in Asa'alibi's Asa anthology uh, of poetry, the Yatima. In order to regain the favor of, his, uh, uh, of this Buyid ruler, he addressed uh, to him uh, in order to wish him well for the coming Mehrajan, uh, uh, a letter, and he authored for him a book about the glory of the dynasty, the Al Masalik Wal Mamalik, the roads and regions. He inserted into the manuscript a Dirhaman Al Khusru Waniyan, probably two late Sasanian coins, and referenced them in his poems. Adud Daula was an admirer of the Sasanian emperor, uh, Empire which he wanted to reenact in Islamic form. Historical learning and ancient coins are con uh, coming here together in this point. Renaissance scholars in the West used to send out to their, uh, to send out to their peers uh, ancient coins as tokens of respect and learning. Tabari surprisingly has no reference to any scholarly uh, interest in uh, past objects. Ibn al-Adim in the 13th century was a scion of a prominent um, Alpine family of uh, Hanafi Qadis. He is famous for his multi-volume history of Aleppo in biographies, the um, Borya, and an abbreviated more narrative history, the Zubdat al-Halab, Fitarih Halab. To fit a Renaissance model, he was well-connected, and David Moran titled his book about him, An Ayyubid Nobleman and His World. The Zubda stands out um, featuring an unprecedented long treatment of the pre-Islamic history of Aleppo. Ibn al-Adim did not know any Greek or supposedly any other language, 
but he had its informants. He begins with a local legend about the foundation of Halab by Abraham, Ibrahim Abraham. He knows the Greek name of Aleppo, Boroya, and read it, uh, rendered by him quite well as Barwa or Biroa. He cites Aristotle, uh, who uh, receives a long biographical entry in this Boria, and he demonstrates his knowledge on biblical, non quranic history of the ancient Orient and connects it with the history of Aleppo. He uh, cared for pre-Islamic monuments with Greek and Latin inscriptions as witnesses of history. One was located at the um, uh, Antioch Gate in Aleppo. Um, quote, quote, I have seen um, uh, in an old book of the Alepines in the script um, uh, some, uh, in, uh, uh, in the script uh, of some of them. I have seen on the arched cantara that is at the Antioch gate of the city of Aleppo in the year 420 of the Hijra, an inscription, Kitaba, in Greek, and inquired about it. Abu Abdallah al Hussein ibn uh, Ibrahim al Husseini al Harani, God supports him, told me that Abu Usama al Khatib of Aleppo told him that uh, his father had told him that he, the father, was present when Abu Sakr al Kubaisi and a man who read Greek, and they copied this inscription and sent the copy uh, of it um, in a note to me. And this is, uh, the city was built by the Lord of Al Mausil when um, Mosul, when Scorpio was ascendant and Jupiter was uh, in it, uh, in Scorpio, and Mercury was adjacent. Much praise to God. This content is probably Hamburg. Ibn al Adim identifies the Lord of Mosul with the Assyrian king uh, Balukus um, from, Aleppo, uh, from Mosul, which is identified with the ancient Nineveh, and that he lived before Alexander. At another place, and uh, just um, uh, briefly, he um, uh, uh, noticed a, a tomb in a village uh, close to uh, Egypt, and where um, at certain times um, a light appears. And uh, uh, I quote, um, above them um, uh, is a Roman inscription. A friend of mine, Baha ad-Din Abu Muhammad al-Hassan ibn Ibrahim ibn al-Khashab, God may have mercy upon him, told me that the Amir Saif ad-Din Ali ibn Kilic ordered that the inscription to be transported. He brought the inscription to some scholars of Latin, ulama Rum, uh, in Aleppo. And it was translated, uh, and it stood, This light is a gift of God, the exalted uh, for us, and something similar mentioned, uh, and there was more. So, But probably also nothing uh, which was uh, really the uh, a core of a classical inscription. Well, this, uh, his curiosity in inscription is present, but we find two occasions among, we find only two uh, uh, occasions of that, among the more of 6,000 printed pages where he uses um, 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 this um, Greek or Latin inscriptions. But we find also two um, uh, instances where he tried to validate a paragraph uh, with um, the uh, citation of a coin. I saw, um, this quote, I saw old copper coins. I followed what was written on them, and so was written on one side, one of the two sides, this false was struck by the city of Aleppo in the year 146, and on the other side of what the Amir Asal ibn Ali has ordered, God may be generous to him. And some paragraphs later, he speaks about a governor of Kinasrin, Musa ibn Sulaiman al Khurasani, and makes also some critical remarks based on the coins. We find all the basic elements of antiquarianism here, the object as proof and source of the past. But only two inscriptions and two coins in his entire text of more than 6,000 printed pages, and I ran through it uh, electronically with uh, some keywords. Famous um, uh, is uh, al Makrizi, and I'm delighted to see that uh, Frederick uh, will speak about him in detail. I looked uh, specifically uh, at his most important works on economics, the Irathat al Umma, Fi Khash of Umma, The Remedy for the Society by Disclosing the Painful Situation, which includes a chapter on Nukut, money, and the Shuzur al Okut, Physical Nukut, the Pearls of the Necklaces in the Report of Coins. In both treatises, 
he collected a lot of akhbar about uh, coins. His sources are not always clear. Some of them can be traced within the literature. Many of his information must have been based on texts, especially his elaborations about changing weights of early uh, coinage, which uh, cannot be uh, uh, supported by the evidence of the coins itself. These uh, have hardly any support or evidence by the coins. When he speaks about coins, some of his descriptions are wrongs and seemingly have probably no base in the actual study of the object. But sometimes he describes more accurately, for example, one coin of Al-Amin, the son of Harun al-Rashid. Quote, this continued uh, until the reign of uh, Amin, Muhammad ibn Harun al-Rashid, who entrusted Al-Abbas ibn Fadl ibn Rabi with the supervision of the mint. The letter enlarged, the letter, in, uh, the letter engraved in large characters, My God, my Lord is God, Rabbi Allah, on the top line, and Al Abbas ibn Fadl uh, on the bottom. The only problem, there is no uh, Ibn Fadl uh, on the coins itself. We have antiquarian efforts in the early and middle Islamic uh, period, but they are rare. Conclusion. As in other cultures of the um, and other cultures, objects of the past functioned in different ways as useful memories for rulers to evoke, as strange and wonderful collectibles, and precious relics of the past as objects for magical apotropaic purposes. But interesting for our question is the collecting collection uh, of material for the explaining the past. Muslim scholars were obsessed with collecting and contextualization of ancient material, but the efforts concentrated on oral and written hadith and akhbar. I looked specifically into two fields. First, the biblical Quranic antiquarianism, and second, the antiquarianism, which is looking back at an idealized imperial past and beyond, and the use of objects to study this past. While the Biblical, Quranic, Antiquarianism never developed and remained Heilsgeschichte, partly because of the Jahiliya roadblock. The study of the idealized pre-imperial and imperial Arabic past through objects had a fertile ground, um, uh, had a fertile ground through the collectors, uh, by, uh, uh, with the collectors of Hadith and Akbar. And indeed we find some traces of uh, interest in objects among them. Compared with Western antiquarianism, it never became a field for itself, and even those, citing, um, those op uh, also citing objects as witness for history did it only occasionally. Why? Here I might just speculate and draw a parallel to uh, one Western phenomenon. The interest in Oriental objects and Islamic coins was most widely spread in the late 18th and early 19th century. Almost every scholar of uh, Islamic studies did some pieces on numismatics. Uh, that was a time when hardly any Arabic text was available in print for scholars uh, to study. This changed in the second half of 19th century when the generation of students of Silvestre de Sassi had produced enormous Uh, numerous editions, widely available. It was much easier to study the past via texts then, uh, than uh, going back like Tuxen in the late 18th century to the Arabic inscriptions of the mantle of uh, Roger uh, in Sicily. The texts were so much richer in historical information that scholars of Oriental studies concentrated on them rather than on reading coins, inscriptions and objects. The wealth of Arabic akhbars might have prevented uh, the rise of the study of objects in its own right. Thank you for your attention.